Okay, welcome to lesson 17. In this lesson, we're actually going to evaluate the two arguments that you read and analyzed for Journal 4, the two articles on steroids and sports, Destroyed by Pedro Martin and um, The Designer Player by Rodrigo Villagomez. Um, so we have three objectives for this lesson. First, we're going to evaluate the two articles on steroids and sports. Uh, we're going to evaluate them in terms of the three appeals that each of the, the arguments use. And then finally, we're going to draw a conclusion about which argument is stronger. And that's what I'm going to want you to do for Journal 5. And I'll give you Journal 5 in Lesson 18. Let's review quickly. So in Lesson 16, I talked about evaluating arguments effectively and how to evaluate an argument and say whether it's strong or weak. And one way you can do that is by using Aristotle's three appeals of arguments. And there he is right there. He's actually the younger in this pair. And here's his older mentor, Plato, also a great philosopher. Um, so Aristotle said, all arguments convince people in three ways or by making three appeals to the readers. First is the logical appeal. So an argument tries to convince people to believe in it by using good logic. And that has to do with having a strong thesis and also having support for that thesis or several good reasons and evidence so making sure that the support is backed by strong evidence so if an author has all of these things a good thesis enough support and strong evidence he or she is making a strong logical appeal but arguments also convince people to believe in them emotionally and that is by stirring our feelings so anytime an argument is trying to make us feel sad or laugh um, or uh, angry so if an author has a really angry sounding tone or a really uses really somber examples those are uh, emotional appeals the author's trying to make us feel a certain way and sometimes they can be very effective and uh, other times they can sort of feel kind of cheap or contrived and not really uh, convince us well Finally, and probably most importantly, is the ethical appeal. And the ethical appeal, or ethos, is where an author convinces us to believe in him or her uh, by proving him or herself as trustworthy. So ethos is all about being trustworthy or credible. And an author can build his or her ethos in many different ways. One, ex one way to build ethos is by having strong logical appeal. A clear thesis and, and good support but also if an author examines the other side and is willing to entertain the other side that can help build his or her ethos if he or she uses effective emotional appeals that can build his or her ethos as well um, so that is if he or she doesn't sound too you know uh, angry or anything which can sort of uh, indicate that he or she's biased um, then you know if he or she stays relatively neutral then you can build a strong ethical appeal that way. Um, finally, an author can build a strong ethical appeal by having a, a good background. Right? Is he or she an expert in the field and qualified to write about the topic? Um, so just having a strong background alone isn't enough to make a strong ethos, but it definitely goes a long way towards making a strong ethos. Um, so those are Aristotle's appeals of argument, and that's a good place to look when you're evaluating an argument to find out is this strong or is it not that strong. So we examined how uh, these appeals work in the ads, and we looked at one sample essay on fast food, and I'm glad to say that that was our last essay on uh, fast food. I'm sure you're getting sick of that topic by now. Um, so I assigned you two readings for uh, Journal 4, and that was To Read Destroyed by Martin and Designer Player by Via Gomez. And I want you to do this exact thing, which is briefly summarize each of the articles and then evaluate the appeals of each article. Um, do they have a strong logical appeal, strong emotional appeal, strong ethical appeal? Um, so in this, in this lesson, um, I'm going to look closely at those two articles um, and practice thinking critically about the different appeals that they use, um, just sort of as a model for what you did for lesson four. And this can also help you with Journal 5, and it can help you with um, the essay that I'm going to assign in two lessons. Um, so this practice, I think, will give you a better sense of what to look for when you're analyzing an argument. So 
without further ado, uh, let's take a close look at Martin's Destroyed and Via Gomez's The Designer Player. Let me flip over there now. Okay, so here we go. So here on the left side of the screen, I have the essays. Here's uh, Peter Martin's Destroyed, and then I also have Via Gomez. Well, let's start with the Destroyed article. I put a little whiteboard on the left here so I can make some, some notes as we're analyzing these articles. So let's start here with uh, Martin's Destroyed. So first, so first you want to start with a brief summary. So I know you've already read these articles and already summarized them and analyzed them. So my summary is going to be relatively brief. I just want to kind of overview the essay. Um, so as you were reading this essay, I'm sure you looked at the author's credibility. So let's just start by reading that quickly, and then we'll just sort of briefly summarize the essay, and then we'll get into our analysis. So it says, Peter Martin was born and raised in New York City, where he attended Hunter College High School. As an undergraduate at Yale University, he wrote a sports column for the Yale Daily News and later became an opinion editor for the newspaper. He was also a writer, photographer, and an editor for the Yale Globalist, a quarterly undergraduate magazine of international affairs. Um... For the globalist, Martin traveled widely, photographing in Tanzania and India and reporting on foreign investment in Venezuela and on water contamination in an Illinois coal mining town. He graduated in 2010 and plans to become a teacher. So here we can see that he's pretty accomplished. I mean, he's definitely a student, but he, he did go to Yale and he wrote a lot when he was in Yale and he traveled <clears throat> and he hopes to become a teacher. I wouldn't say he's an expert in the fields or the industry, but I wouldn't necessarily discount him just based on his background because he does seem to be a pretty intellectual person. He's traveled a lot and he's written a lot, so he could potentially write a strong essay. Uh, but do keep in mind that he's a student. So we'll come back and we'll talk more about his credibility and his background after we look at his essay. So let's move into the essay. So it's called Destroyed. And just briefly, I'm going to overview what he does in the essay. So he starts his essay by saying, that last week, um, you know, he had to write a paper, and the paper was about mind enhancers, and he wondered whether or not they were cheating, and he connected that naturally with steroids and sports. And he said this, um, I know it's bad. Athletes out there, stop cheating. Cheating ruins the game. Stop. Um, I actually think this is probably his thesis. We'll come back to that in a second. But basically, his essay is about how um, athletes should not be cheating and um, steroids are, are bad for players and bad for the game. So from there, he moves on to talk about what steroids are. So he gives us a little definition of what steroids are. And he says that steroids have become very popular and that now a lot of people are betting on steroids in, in Las Vegas. Um, and people are um, sort of angry about these players and chastising those players. And he says that he agrees with that kind of anger or that kind of rhetoric. Um, and he thinks that steroids in sports are, are, are not good. They're not good for the sport, um, and, and they're cheating. And here he moves into his first argument, right? So why steroids should be you know, removed for sports, or why more should be done to remove steroids from sports. He says it all goes back to the period of the game, and he gives an example of the ancient Olympians and how they didn't use artificial enhancers, and that's the point of sports. Um, from there, he, he makes the connection to today and says today is not at all like how it was during ancient Greece. Modern day players are doing all kinds of uh, steroids and sports and drugs. Um, and he says there's another problem too. So not just it ruins the purity of the game, but he also says it's, it's dangerous for players. And here he gives an example of Ken Camantini and how he died. Um, and then he sort of uh, moves into his conclusion and says, you know, essentially steroids are hurting players, but they're also hurting the game, um, and they they could be um, dangerous in the long run. So, you know, in short, we need to just really do more to stop steroids in sports. So that's essentially what happens in the essay. You know, so we could summarize it that way, but then we want to get into an analysis. And... Like I mentioned in the last lesson, um, and we did with the fast food is fat food, and I was hoping you would do with this journal, when you're analyzing, you want to use the appeals of argument. So we'd start by looking at the argument's logic. 
right? So the first thing we want to know is what is the thesis? So I already mentioned this. Um, I think his closest statement to the thesis is probably up here where it underlined. He says, athletes out there, stop cheating. Cheating ruins the game. Stop. Um, he doesn't exactly say how, how we should stop uh, athletes from using steroids and cheating, but his thesis is essentially that um, athletes should not cheat. So if I had to guess what is his thesis, I would say it's this. Athletes should not cheat, or more should be done to prevent athletes from cheating. Um, so once you know his thesis, we can ask, what are his reasons, or why? What does he say to prove that athletes should not cheat? And if we look at his essay, he doesn't have a whole lot to prove why athletes should not cheat. Really, he only has two pieces of evidence in here, uh, or two uh, reasons. First, he mentions uh, steroids ruin the purity of sports. And here he gives the example of the ancient Olympians and how star uh, sports aren't at all today like they were then. And then at the end here, uh, in paragraph 9, he mentions uh, steroids hurt players. So I would say that's it. If we boil this argument down to what's the thesis and what are his points, his thesis is athletes should not cheat, and his reasons why they shouldn't cheat is because cheating ruins the purity of the game and cheating hurts players. Um, really nothing else in here is, is proving his argument. Um, so let's take a look at these. So if we're going to analyze the logic, we want to look closely at each of these points and ask ourselves, are we convinced by each of these points? So the first point he mentions here on paragraph 7 is, uh, he says, it all goes back to purity. Sport, after all, isn't just entertainment. The original Olympians, heroes of sport around the world, saw nothing lighthearted or comical in their competition. Under the mountain of the gods, they played besting one another in competitions of strength and skill to honor the powers above. Zeus, one can imagine, was no fan of artificial enhancers. He liked athletes natural, apparently so much so that even clothing was off limits. From this history, we receive the spirit of sport. Competition is to be played, fa uh, to be played fairly and naturally without the help from extra-human objects, artifacts, or chemicals that can be manufactured, bought, and sold. Nothing but grass and human flesh on any field where fair play is to be found. And then in the next paragraph he says, So here we find ourselves today. The fields once clean are soaked in juice. Baseball players, bicyclists, and track athletes are among the most egregious violators, or at least the most visible. The Olympics in their modern-day incarnation have lost luster as a result of the doping scandals across sports, and no one seems ready or able to stop the abuse. Is this point convincing? Does he convince you that... Uh, steroids ruin the purity of sport? How does he do that? He compares sports today, right, uh, people using uh, st steroids and enhancers, to sports from the ancient Olympians, and how Zeus didn't like artificial enhancers, and the original intention of sport was just to be played fairly and purely. Is that true? Was the original intention of sport in ancient Athens, when the Olympians played, just to be fairly and naturally? Did the Olympians use any kind of enhancers at all? Did Zeus like the Olympians a certain way? Who can answer that definitively? I'm guessing probably none of you because none of us were in ancient Greece, right? How can he say what sport was like in ancient Greece? He can't really, right? because we don't know what happened in ancient Greece. Zeus is just a mythical god, right? Zeus isn't even real. Um, so he's kind of using a, he's comparing real sports to a mythical illusion of sports in ancient Greece. 
that we can't even say was real or not real. Um, I mean, I'm guessing, I, th I think I remember that weren't some of the ancient Olympians killed if they didn't perform well in sports? Weren't they um, enslaved and made to play sports? I think so. Um, if that was the case, I would guess that people in ancient Greece were probably did even more things to enhance their sport and their ability. Um, you know, I'm sure they were, they would eat whatever they could eat if they thought it would enhance their sport. I'm sure they did whatever they could do to win their sport. Um, so this is a really odd example, and I don't think it's very strong at all, because um, it seems like that the nature of competition and the nature of sports is to win, and it's always been that way. And it's not about purity of the game, it's about winning, right? Um, so this isn't a very good example, I don't think at all. He really doesn't have strong evidence here at all. So I would say this is, is really weak. And the fact that he compares modern sports to a mythical illusion of sports in ancient Greece is uh, really even hurts his ethos. That's, that's a pretty weak comparison. Um, but let's take a look at his other point. He says in paragraph 9, there's another problem uh, to sports, which is that it hurts the players. He says, but there's another problem to doping, one not seen on the field. As new anti-steroid messages illustrate visually with limbs falling off bodies, steroids are widely destructive to the, their users. Though they may feel like magic to an athlete recovering from an injury or simply looking for easy strength, their, their longer-term effects are undeniable and devastating. Ken Camantini, the whistleblower for the steroid problem in Major League Baseball, died three years ago of a heart attack at age 41, and only eight years after winning baseball's Most Valuable Player Award. He had, been, he had taken steroids during his MVP season and for several years after. It is the players much more than the games that we must protect. Um, so here he's making the point that steroids hurt players. And he actually gives us some genuine evidence, right? He doesn't uh, base his argument on a mythical idealization of sports. He gives us some real evidence here to support the ideas that it hurts players. Um, and the evidence is the example here with Ken Camantini. He says this guy who was the whistleblower for steroids in sports and baseball um, actually died after eight years after winning MVP. So his evidence is this guy, Camantini, died. So he's saying baseball hurts players. This guy, Ken Camantini, died. Therefore, steroids are dangerous. Is this good evidence? Is that strong? Do you believe steroids are dangerous? I think I believe that steroids are dangerous, but I'm not so sure about this evidence. Ken Camantini is only one player, right? So in this sense, we have a piece of anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal evidence is evidence based on examples, or single examples. Um, so in this case, Kementini is just one example of a person who died of steroids in sports. The problem with anecdotal evidence, or evidence based on examples, is that um, even if we had 10 examples of people dying of steroids in sports, which he doesn't have, but even if he did, it still wouldn't be strong enough to prove the ultimate conclusion that steroids are dangerous. Um, so the problem with the examples is that you can kind of give lots and lots of them, and we could probably also give counterexamples that prove the opposite. Maybe there are some players who took steroids in sports who didn't suffer any um, health effects at all. So anecdotal evidence as a rule isn't really worth that much because um, it doesn't definitively prove the conclusions. Um, so that's one problem with this, is that it's only based on one example, Ken Camantini. But there's another problem here, and that's with this particular example as a whole. Um, Ken Camantini died eight years after winning sports. Do we know that that's based on his steroid usage? I mean, it was eight years later. It's not like he took steroids and died instantly. So this is very similar to the example we saw in Fast Food is Fat Food. Here we have an ad hoc 
argument. HOC, sorry. Um, so an ad hoc fallacy. So an ad hoc fallacy says that just because something preceded something else doesn't necessarily mean that it caused it, right? So and that's the case here, is that he's assuming that steroids caused this death, but Ken Camantini could have died for many reasons. Maybe he wasn't healthy in other ways. Maybe he didn't maintain his physical strength. Maybe he didn't eat very well. Maybe he smoked. There could have been many reasons this guy died. It's not necessarily based on steroids in sports. So again, even though he has some evidence here, it's still pretty weak. Um, so I'd say that kind of hurts his logical appeal in here as well. Um, so that's a good example of the logic, right? But we would also want to take a look at his pathos in here, or his emotional appeal. And uh, this guy, Martin, does use some emotional appeals in places, right? Like here at the very conclusion, he says, Athletes, those who dope, who take steroids, who cheat, are victims far more serious maladies than their sports. They will pay the price with their own lives too many years after they retire. Um, so this is basically just kind of meant to scare us. You can hear his tone is kind of um, angry in here, and he's trying to, you know, uh, show us that this is a very serious issue, but he hasn't entirely proved it, so this emotional appeal isn't all that strong. He also has some emotional appeals towards the beginning. Right here where he says, Athletes out there, stop cheating. Cheating ruins the game. Stop. It kind of sounds um, angry, but even more so whiny. It's like he's really he's really just trying to, to get us angry. He calls steroids nasty chemicals that they're guzzling down, rubbing in, and shooting up. Here's a good example of an emotional appeal, too. He's just trying to dissuade us from liking steroids by sort of demonizing them and calling them nasty chemicals. Um, he's not giving us logical reasons in here against steroids. He's just trying to draw our emotions on this point. Um, so that's, yeah. again, I wouldn't say a very strong use of emotional appeal. If he had a better, clearer essay, that might be okay. But as a general rule, whenever authors are um, trying to stir our emotions, I tend to sort of see it as um, uh, a little bit contrived. It only works in a couple of ways. Um, so that, that's his pathos in a few spots, and there's probably a couple other examples. Finally, you'd want to consider the author's overall ethos. Um, so in here, his ethos is based on everything. His background, which we said we wouldn't discount him, but he isn't an expert. And when we think about his argument, his logic isn't very strong. He, he bases his reasons on some questionable evidence. That all hurts his ethos, I would say. The fact that his emotional appeals are kind of wild and, and really trying to stir our emotions, I think, also hurts his credibility and ethos for me. And finally, um, you know, his background, since he's not really an expert, he's more of a student, I would say, not very strong. So overall, I would say his, eth his ethos is pretty weak in here, um, you know, as a result of his argument not being that strong, his wild emotional appeals, and his lack of sort of genuine credibility. Um, so there's a good good example of sort of thinking critically about an argument. So hopefully you did some of that in the journal. That's what I want you to do is look closely at the logic, consider the pathos or emotional appeal, and then consider the author's overall ethos. Um, so let's take a look at um, the Vill Villa Gomez piece now. And we'll do the same kind of thing. So here's the piece by Rodrigo Vill Villa Gomez. and it's called The Designer Player. Uh, and this one's a little bit longer. Um, let's take a quick look at Rodrigo Villagomez's bio, and then we'll sort of overview it with a brief summary. Rodrigo Villagomez is a blogger, podcaster, and social media journalist. Born in 1976, he graduated from high school in Stockton, California in 1994, joined the U.S. Army as a musician, and served 10 years in Afghanistan and Korea as well as stateside. In 2005, Villa Gomez returned to Stockton to pursue a career in sports broadcasting. He worked for Citadel Broadcasting, where he held various positions ranging from promotions, assistant, to producer, uh, to on-air talent. Um, at the same time, he attended San Joaquin Delta College and reported on-campus sports for the college's newspaper, radio station, and television network. Villa Gomez earned degrees in liberal arts and sciences and continued... Uh, and communications. He is currently the owner of and a play-by-play -play announcer for uh, 
Valley Sports Network, an online broadcast service that covers high school and semi-professional sports in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, so here, just from his bio, we can tell that Villa Gomez is probably going to be a little bit more credible since he is an expert in the field. He does sports broadcasting, although it is possible that that makes him a little bit biased since he's coming at it from the entertainment perspective, not the player's perspective. Um, I think that he does probably carry more credibility just from his background than Martin since he's an expert in the field. Um, so let's overview the piece real quick with a, a brief summary. So again, this is called the designer player. Um, and it's a little bit longer. So first he talks about baseball as an entertainment industry and how um, the industry has really grown and how these players are role models. Um, and at the end of the first, and he mentions steroids in sports, and at the end of the first paragraph he mentions, many believe that these drugs decrease the integrity of the players and ultimately the game itself. But if it were not for the small percentage of players who have recently been found to use steroids, baseball would not be enjoying the success it does today. We should be thanking these players for keeping the game popular. So in here, we can see that he's for steroids. So his thesis doesn't really become entirely clear to the end, but we can tell that he's pro-steroids. Since he says we should be thanking these players and not demonizing them. Um, um, so then he starts by defining steroids. He says what steroids are. And then he moves into uh, an interesting series of paragraphs where he brings in counter-arguments and then refutes them. And he does that for three paragraphs. So first he says most people have a problem with steroids because of the speed with which users obtain results. And then he kind of challenges that and says, yeah, speed isn't really that helpful. Um, and then he says some people have a problem with steroids because they think it attacks the baseball's integrity. And then he kind of counters that with some examples of integrity already being ruined. And then he says another of the major arguments used against steroids in sports is that it can cause health issues. And he actually counters that one and says, well, steroids could be used safely. Um, so he does these three counter arguments and then refutes each of the three with evidence. He uses many sources in here, like here he's citing Perry. Um, and in this paragraph, he cites uh, Jose Canseco in his book. So he cites lots of outside evidence, something that um, uh, Martin doesn't necessarily do. And then he moves into his main argument. So he says baseball fans love home runs. And he shows us why they love home runs. And then he sort of says, um, you know, a recent, uh, you know, a really exciting time in home run was this, in baseball, was this home run uh, sort of rally that Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were having in the, the 90s. And that was a time when baseball was really exciting and people were hitting a lot of home runs. And that was actually driven by uh, performance enhancing drugs. So he uses these two paragraphs to sort of show us that people like home runs and that's one of the points of baseball. And then he says, you know, uh, for example, here's a time when baseball was really exciting, lots of home runs, and that was a result of steroids. And that brings us, him to his conclusion, which is really where he kind of clarifies his thesis. You know, he's saying in the conclusion that uh, the, the point of baseball is entertainment, right? And steroids keep the game more entertaining. So I would say that his thesis is something like that. Steroids should be allowed in baseball because they keep it interesting or entertaining. I think that's probably what his thesis really is here. It's baseball, steroids should be allowed in baseball because they keep it um, entertaining. Um, so there's his thesis. Um, so let's take a closer look um, at each of his arguments with his, his logos or his logic. Um, so like I said before, at the beginning he does this thing where he looks at three counter arguments and he refutes them. So the first one he looks at is that the speed with which they obtain results. And he says, people have a problem with that. And he says, being big and bulky and being able to hit the ball out of the park is great, but not being able to move those humongous arms around quickly enough to hit a 90 mile an hour fastball is counterproductive. To be a better player, a player must combine overall uh, and 
an over-the-top workout schedule with the drugs. So if it's possible to become the greatest player just by using steroids and doing nothing else, you'd think that everybody would be doing so. So here he's saying, you know, steroids alone don't really give us results, um, which is true. Players do have to practice too. But the thing he kind of misses here is that steroids do give them a big advantage. Um, so I think he kind of leaves that out of the refute or kind of misses that point in the refute is that, you know, all baseball players work hard, but those who take the steroids are definitely going to have an advantage. And he's kind of making it like they don't like just taking steroids is, is going to, um, is not really going to increase somebody's ability, but steroids really do increase ability. And a lot of steroids don't necessarily make players big and bulky, like he mentions here, but a lot of steroids also make players sort of lean and faster. And he kind of neglects those kinds of steroids. So even though he does have a point here with his refute, um, I don't think he's really taking into account all of steroids. Um, so here's another one. He says, other people have a problem with steroids in sports because it's an attack on the baseball's integrity. And then here he says, you know, long before the media brought the issue of steroids to the forefront, the drugs were being injected, rubbed, or swallowed in locker rooms. And uh, Jose Canseco in his book talks a little bit about that. Um, and he says, in 2002, Kementini, retired third baseman, told Sports Illustrated, it's no secret what's going on at baseball. At least half the guys are using. Uh, they talk about it. They joke about it with each other. So here he's saying... Uh, steroids have actually been happening for a long time, so the integrity of baseball has already been ruined. And he actually says, in reality, the so-called integrity of the game has been lost for years. Pitchers have always found ways to doctor the ball so that their pitches have an extra movement. Batters have used lighter or corked bats to achieve a faster swing. Pete Rose was caught betting on his team while he was a manager. Baseball has not been a fair game for years. So this one, I think, is much stronger. First, he uses some evidence from some sources um, so that we can see that steroids have actually been uh, in baseball for a long time. Um, also, he gives some good examples in here of um, how integrity has been lost. So again, this is anecdotal evidence, but he gives several different examples. So it does make it stronger, and it kind of goes along with the idea that um, steroids have been in baseball for a long time. So I think that this is actually a pretty strong refute, you know. I think he does a good job of challenging the idea that um, baseball steroids ruin baseball's integrity because integrity has really been gone for a long time. So here's a pretty good point that he makes. This one's not quite as strong, but this one's a little bit stronger. So in his last counter-argument or refute, he says, another of the major problems with steroids in sports is the health factor. You know, and he says steroids have been linked to liver, prostate, and even testicular cancers, as well as heart disease. According to epidemiologist Charles Yuselis, however, we know that steroids can be used with reasonable measure of safety. We know this because they're used in medicine all the time, just not to enhance body image or improve athletic performance. Steroids are also used in the treatment of breast cancer. In response to the fear of long-term effects of continued use of steroids, Yuselis has to say this, we've had thousands of upon, upon thousands of long-term studies done on tobacco, cocaine, you name it. But for as much as you see and hear about anabolic steroids, we haven't taken that step. The truth is uh, that what we hear all the time from modern medicine, we can't get cancer in the ways that we never thought about. Um, so here he's, he's refuting the idea that steroids actually cause health issues. And he cites uh, a doctor, Charles Yasela. So this helps his argument a lot because he's citing somebody who's an expert in the field who says that we can use steroids uh, safely. And then um, he also says there hasn't even been that much research done on steroids. So we don't really know that steroids are bad for us. So again, I think this one is pretty good because he's citing an expert source. And it does sort of prove that steroids can be used safely, so they're not necessarily dangerous. So I would say this is a pretty good refute, too, of the safety point, um, is that steroids can be used safely. Um, the one thing he kind of forgets in here is that players using steroids aren't necessarily using them in the, the reasonable, measured, medical kind of way. They're probably using higher dosages of steroids. Plus, they're probably doing it in a back room kind of way. Maybe there's not the proper sanitization. They could be sharing needles. Um, so there's lots of potential issues with the ways people are using steroids. Even though I think Villagomez is right, they probably can be used safely in a controlled environment in a controlled way. So again, this is a pretty good point, although it does miss 
uh, a little bit of the real context of how players are using steroids, but still pretty good. Um, so I'd say this is overall pretty nice, even though he has some problems with it. He does have um, some good refutes of some of the major arguments. From there, he moves into his uh, his major reasons, right? So first, he says fans love to see home runs, and he talks about uh, Babe Ruth hitting lots of balls out. And here, he uses a little bit of pathos, some emotional appeal to sort of evoke our sense of um, excitement in the game. You know, he says um, nobody wants to be known as just the one who could. Uh, who could consistently get on base, or the one with the stellar batting average. They all want to be the one who gets noticed by both the press and the fans for home runs, with the ever-present uh, chance that sluggers can take take it deep when they step up to the plate, the game might get a little boring. Um, and, it's, and it also gives a little bit of evidence here and says, in fact, baseball itself has been making the parks shorter in order to encourage home runs because fans really love those home runs. They love to see the sheer beauty of baseball leaving the stadium. So here's a good example of pathos in here. He's sort of describing how the beauty of, uh, of home runs to evoke our sort of sense of passion. And I think this works pretty well because it's true. Home runs are exciting. So in this paragraph, we do see, yeah, home runs are exciting. Maybe we can agree with him on this point. Um, and then he sort of uses that pretty well in this next paragraph to say, you know, the recent batch of steroid allegations is not the first case of performance of hammer drugs in baseball causing a stir. And during the 1998 season, Mark McGuire broke Roger Maris' long-standing record of 61 home runs in a single season. This new record could not have come at a better time for baseball, as most fans still held on to disappointing memories of the 1994 player strike and the season cut short. McGuire's assault on uh, the record revitalized the game and gave people a reason to watch again. That joy was carried into the very next season when both McGuire and Sammy Sosa embarked on a head-to-head -head battle to break McGuire's record. After the excitement died down, controversy ignited when accusations were made that McGuire was taking Andro, a substance equal to the over-the-counter supplement of hydroxycut. So most fans didn't care, um, they just loved the excitement of it. So this, I think, is the strongest point in this whole essay, right? So first he convinces us that we like to see home runs, we like it to be exciting. And then he gives a great example of a time when baseball was super exciting. Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were sort of slugging back and forth, and that was kind of driven by a performance-enhancing drug, Andro. And I remember this uh, clearly. My brother was a big fan of Mark McGuire, and this was a super exciting time in baseball. It was a very good time to be a baseball fan. Um, so I think this is pretty convincing because I remember this time. Even though it's just an example, it was one of the, the best times uh, in baseball, um, and that was kind of driven by performance-enhancing drugs. Um, so I think that he makes a really good point in here, which is that um, fans love the excitement of baseball, and steroids in sports do help to make that more exciting. You know, and then in the conclusion, he sort of says, you know, baseball is all about entertainment, right? And, um, you know, we shouldn't look to baseball to produce a perfect example of humanity, Right? These, these players are on a stage. They're basically kind of like actors, and we just want to see that and see the excitement. Um, so from his point of view, you know, that steroids should be allowed in baseball because they keep it interesting, I would say he does prove that. I think he has a really good example of how um, baseball is exciting when, when steroids are used. Um, and I think that... Um, he does a, a pretty good job of refuting some of the major arguments against steroids in sports. So I would say his logos is pretty strong. I mean, if we compare that to uh, to Martin, this is much stronger. He has, he, has, he has a clear order of his points. His points are much more developed. He has pretty good support for his points. Some of them do have problems, but overall I would say they're relatively strong. Um, he also uses pathos pretty effectively, like we saw with the one example. Um, and in a couple of places, he sort of evokes a sense of pathos, too. Um, he says at the very end, Above all, we should remember that baseball is a game. It's intended for the entertainment of the crowd. There are, of course, fanatics like myself who hang on every swing and throw, but most are casual fans who watch their favorite team when possible. Um, so here, we can sort of feel the pathos here. He's sort of talking about... 
himself being a fanatic and hanging on every swing and throw. There's another example of pathos, but he doesn't really go over the top. I would say his tone for the most part feels pretty neutral, um, not very angry, um, not too impassioned, just in a couple of places. So he has a pretty good use of the emotional appeal. So then if we consider his overall ethos, I would say that his ethos is pretty strong in here because he's sort of an expert in the industry and he has pretty good arguments aside from a few small things in here. Uh, and he has a pretty good use of pathos. Plus he's looking at counter arguments and challenging genuine counter arguments and he builds a really strong reason to the end. So I would say his ethos here overall is really strong, um, especially compared to Martin. Um, the one thing about Villa Gomez that you want to be careful of is that his, his thesis is just based on the idea of baseball as entertaining. So if you don't accept the idea that baseball is entertainment and you sort of see baseball as being, um, as being more about the competition and to see who's better than actually about entertainment, you might not be able to accept his argument. Um, so that's one of the major conceits in here. Um, especially because if we think about the reality of baseball, uh, and steroids. If if we were to allow steroids into baseball, um, overall it would pretty much be a bad thing. I mean, because if pros are playing uh, with steroids, then wouldn't college people also start using steroids? And then maybe high school kids would start using steroids? So when would steroids begin? There would have to be some point at which steroids would, um, you know, uh, would start being introduced. Also, you know, I'm not so sure about his point about the safety. Like I mentioned before, um, I'm not sure steroids are safe. And he even acknowledges that there haven't been many studies done on it. Pro maybe it's worse than, than we think it is, you know. So, um, so I'm not that convinced by that point either. So um, Villa Gomez has a really hard sell. I don't think a lot of people are likely to believe in his argument. But he does make a pretty strong argument overall. Um, so I would say, you know, if we if we look at it that way, thinking critically about both of them, comparing both of them, we can see Villa Gomez probably has the stronger argument. Um, so that's it for the analysis. So hopefully that helped you a little bit. Now let's flip back to the PowerPoint and kind of wrap up. So here we took a close look at Villa Gomez's uh, dis designer player and Martin's destroyed, and we compared both of those using the appeals of argument, and hopefully that helped you. So make sure when you're evaluating your text that you think critically about those texts. Um, you can use the three appeals of arguments as places to look when you're evaluating. You know, use that logical appeal to consider um, the author's thesis, support, and evidence. Use the emotional appeal to look at the author's tone, where the author's trying to make us angry or sad. Um, and then consider the overall ethical appeal or the author's credibility. Do you see that author is credible? Um, you know, what makes the author credible? Does he or she have a strong background? Does he or she look at the other side of the argument? Does he or she use strong evidence to support his or ideas? Does he or she have pretty good control over the emotional appeal? Um, and then after analyzing, you want to make sure that you synthesize, right? So make sure you bring it together and draw some kind of ultimate conclusion. So overall, Villa Gomez is this strong. Overall, Martin's argument is kind of weak. Um, and since we're using two that speak to one another, we're probably going to want to take it that step further and say which one is stronger. In this case, Villa Gomez, is, I think, is stronger. So we're using our critical thinking and our analysis to reach some kind of a conclusion about the overall credibility of the text. So that's it for this lesson. So move on to lesson 18. And in lesson 18, I'm going to discuss logic a little bit more closely. And I'm going to give you journal 5 which is going to be another sort of practice analysis, and I'm going to have you compare two articles and draw a conclusion. And that's going to be a good uh, sample model for the uh, next essay, which I'm going to give you in lesson 19. And so I'll see you in the next one. All right.